Good evening and welcome to beautiful Glendalough, high up in the Wicklow Mountains, for this celebration of some of Ireland's most stunning wildlife and wild places. So you join us live here at the Upper Lake in Glendalock. It is the most beautiful evening, about 14 degrees, but it feels warmer. Welcome to BioBlitz Live 2013. Uh, as you know, for the month of May, RT has been going wild across all of its platforms on radio, on TV and digital. And the whole idea is to get you at home out there uh, to explore and experience nature at first hand, to be part of it. And we are delighted to be part of it. Sinead. We are. Thank you. And I think you guys will agree it's been an amazing, an amazing month. And tonight we are featuring a unique 24-hour event taking place across the country, BioBlitz Ireland 2013. And right now, as we speak, in four very different locations, a race is on to count the extraordinary number of wild plants and animals that they can find, if, of course, they know where to look. Now, we'd love you to be part of it all as well, so do tweet us throughout the show and let us know what you've seen and recorded. And what wonderful locations we have. Loch Key Forest Park in County Roscommon with 30 separate wooded islands giving a snapshot of what Ireland looked like thousands of years ago and now a haven for wild creatures. The magnificent Burren, one of the most striking landscapes in Europe, mountains of jagged rock, a vast limestone pavement hiding some of the rarest plants and animals on this island. We'll also be logging our way into the history books at the Colebrook Estate, a lush 1,000-acre site in County Fermanagh that has never before been surveyed and whose secrets are just waiting to be uncovered. And of course, right here in Wicklow Mountains National Park, you can see this, you can see why this place is called the Garden of Ireland. Yeah, absolutely stunning. Well, it all started at all four locations just over two hours ago, and here's how it started right where we are in Glendalock. So here we are now, I'm with Liam Lysett, and Liam Lysett is director of the National Biodiversity Centre based in Waterford, and Liam is responsible for BioBlitz, so I suppose we should start by explaining exactly what BioBlitz is. Well, BioBlitz is a race against time, as you say, with competition where we have 180 of Ireland's key national experts on biodiversity at four sites recording the rich diversity that we have. And it's quite simple, that site that has recorded the most species of wildlife after 24 hours, will be declared winner of Bible. It's 2013. And they get a wonderful trophy. You have it in your hands. This is it. We have. <laughs> this is what it's all about. Or one part of it is we have the Ireland's Bible. trophy to be presented to the winning site after the event. Now explain what you guys do. Well, we're the National Biodiversity Data Centre, and we're the ones who collate all the information. As you can imagine, there'll probably be information on over a thousand species recorded in Wicklow here uh, over the next 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So we are the ones that have to take those, inf those data, we have to collate them, we have to ensure that they're validated and we put them live on our website at biodiversityireland.ie so people can see what progress is, doing, is happening over the 24 hours. And biodiversity is important. It is very important. It contributes 2.8 billion to the Irish economy every year, but it's a, an unseen contribution it makes. It provides uh, clean water, fresh air and productive soil and that's why it's so important to look after it and manage it. Where do you get the 2.8 billion figure? Uh, it's, it's, uh, the government have actually given that figure, they had an economist to try to quantify the contribution bio biodiversity makes, so it's not me saying that, it's our good government who have put that figure on it. Now explain exactly what biodiversity is. Biodiversity really is a simple term to describe the variety of life that we have in Ireland, from the very tiny, minute, single-cell organisms that are found in water, 
through to the plants, the variety of insects, and then, of course, the much larger animals that we have, like the whales and, uh, and the deer and the like. It's just an all-encompassing term to describe that wonderful diversity of life that we have in Ireland. OK, Liam, thank you very much indeed. As Liam was saying, this is a race. There are four locations. We're at Glendalough. This is one of them, and it promises to be a fascinating 24 hours. Uh, some of the most elusive animals uh, the teams will be trying and searching for are creatures of the night, and they make up about half of all the mammals we find in Ireland. And Colin is going to have a look at one of them right now. Now, we were hoping, Connor, weren't we, that we were going to be able to go up into this attic and find one of these little bats, but I'm afraid you spent the whole afternoon crawling around they up did. there, but you didn't have any luck. They didn't play ball, I'm afraid. They're a bit slow coming back to their summer roost this year on account of the very cold weather we're having, so their numbers are very f much down compared to normal, so they're still hibernating in their winter roost, unfortunately, but it's me and it's crazy, like, you know, but that's what we've got to do anyway. But hopefully they'll be out flying tonight because there'll be midges around, and I'm hoping to get, you know, a few species here anyway. Yeah, well, in fact, we put a camera in place last night and we got some shots of them coming out of their roost. But what exactly is going on in this roost above our heads right now? Who's actually up there? Well, these are some uh, pregnant females and they've come here to have their young. And they only have one young per year. So they'll be heavily pregnant now and in another three or four weeks they'll be giving birth to their single baby and they'll nurse that with, um, in milk for the next six to seven weeks after that until it's big enough to fly. And they give birth to some pretty enormous babies. They certainly do, yeah. They're between a quarter and a third the weight of the mother. So it is, you know, like a nine stone woman giving birth to a three stone baby, like to bring tears to your eyes just thinking about it. So that's only why they have one. And so how do you do, you're going to be wandering around tonight. How are you actually going to monitor what bats are here? Well, we can tell the different types apart using a little gadget called a bat detector and we can listen to the sounds they make. And like bird song, they all make different calls and different songs. So it's the same with the bats. Once you get a bit of practice in, you can actually tell the different species apart. And the ones up here, they use a kind of echolocation that's high frequency. So we can't hear it as human beings, but these detectors allow us to be able to hear it. And they're very distinctive sounds. So these little bat detectors we can use um, allow us to actually tell which species are around us, even if we can't actually see what's flying around us. OK, and I'm just going to just ask you, how many bat species do you think you're going to find in Glendalough tonight? I'm hoping to get the full seven that we know is here, maybe uh, seven or eight. It's because of the cold weather, we'd be lucky, like, you know, but you never know, like, I'm fingers crossed in that every species count when it comes to bioblitz, so we're hoping that... Uh, the, bat, the bats have played their part as well. Thanks a lot, Connor. Thank you. You're okay, Connor. So now we uh, can see how you get bats in a dark cave, but what about the many creatures that live underwater and out of sight? How do we discover them? Josie Mann from Isle Inland Fisheries Ireland, you're going to tell me just how to do that. Yes, we have a very well established technique. It's called electrofishing. We have a backpack on our back, and basically there's a handset on which an electrical current goes to the handset, attracts the fish to it. Ooh, OK, now we can see the lads are at it here in the background. We can hear the noises. Is it dangerous for the actual fish? This technique is highly established, causes minimum amount of stress to fish. As you can see, we have some here in the tank that we caught yes. earlier. And Inland Fisheries Ireland have established this technique very well and works extremely well over the years. Now, let's have a look at these brown trout now that are in the tank. They're not alone, though, are they? But do tell me more about the brown trout itself. OK, the brown trout here that we have in the tank, they are, the big one here is probably about four to five years old. The age of them and the size of them depends on the general area in which they live. Trout have amazing vision. They really do. They can see pretty much anything. They're very sensitive to sight and to hearing. They have monocular vision so they can see things right coming up to them and it's very helpful for prey and for any dangers that they might see in front of them. And what about the other species of fish that we can find in Irish rivers and canals and lakes. We have in this tank here we've got juvenile salmon, we also have lamprey and eel mm. and in our rivers and lakes as well you can also find roach, tench, mm. carp, perch and pike. There are many many fish in our rivers and lakes and we ask you to preserve these fish for today and future generations. Now I, I love that this is all going on in the background. How many fish might they catch at any one time? They could probably catch a couple in terms of three or four. There's mm -hmm. a few different species here in the Glen Elo River mm -hmm. so they could catch many different species at a time. Thank you so much Josie. I think people like myself are going to be very surprised at just how beautiful underwater Ireland can actually be. 
Thank you very much indeed, Sinead. Well, as you know, technology has certainly revolutionised the way we observe and record wildlife, and we use it a lot on Mooney Goes Wild and RT Radio 1. If you're familiar with the radio programme, you'll be familiar with Nest Watch. It all started back in the year 2000 when we teamed up with Wild Ireland, and a pair of jackdaws, we call them Jackie and Daw, had built a nest in a chimney, and then they laid the eggs and they hatched them out, and we followed their progress, and then we put a camera in to a kingfisher bank in Druid's Glen. We got some cracking pictures. Look at that, they look prehistoric, beautiful stuff. Uh, I've been lucky to have blue tits at my house for the last 10 years, and we're streaming that live at the moment on rt.ie slash Mooney. Beautiful stuff from the blue tits there. They're sitting on seven eggs. You can log on after this program and have a look at the activity. And of course, we've got swallows at Oris and Uchtaron. Michael D. Higgins, Uchtaron the Heron, allowed us back in with our cameras. And we've got some great footage of swallows there. Look at that. Imagine the journey that swallow makes all the way from Africa just to get here to the same nest. Anyway, next week we hope to add to our collection of birds with a kestrel. And I'm glad to say that John Lusby, who's the raptor officer with uh, raptor conservation officer, should I say, with Birdwatch Ireland is with us. John, thanks for coming along today. Hi, Derek. You look a bit like Ming Flanagan, I have to say. <laughs> I've been supporting this for a while now. Talk to me about the kestrel. Yeah, so the kestrel, it's uh, one of our most common birds of prey in Ireland. And I suppose people would be most familiar with it as the falcon that, uh, that hovers. And it's a fantastic natural spectacle to see them just hanging in, hanging in the air in an updraft of wind as they hunt. But uh, this will be the first time we're hoping to launch a Kestrel Nest Camera. And uh, just during the week, we, uh, we installed some special nest, uh, nest cameras at a range of sites around the country. And, and it, it's been an unusual enough year just uh, because of the weather. Yeah, and there's the quite a few pairs. Mad. It has, yeah. So they're finding it quite difficult to hunt and to, to feed young. So there's quite a few pairs that haven't bred. But luckily, we were able to get some footage of um, pairs which have uh, produced eggs and, and, and young. And as you say, hopefully, we're, we hope to launch the uh, a live Kestrel nest camera to site in County Offaly next week. Has the one we're going to be showing, has it built a nest or has it just laid it inside of a barn? It or has, what? they're down to business already so the female is currently incubating two eggs, she's sitting on two eggs so hopefully all going according to plan they'll hatch in the coming weeks and we'll be able to watch that un un unfold and see and see all the happenings within the is nest. Is two good or bad? Two, two is below average for Kestrels but that's I suppose reflected by the by, by the poor weather and the fact that they've bred it all it is, is quite good because it's such an unusual year. So, so, so two is quite good and hopefully as I say both will hatch and both will survive and hopefully we'll be able to be able to watch that unfold. Now you have a special license for the, doing this don't you? That's right and you have to be obviously very careful the birds are quite sensitive to disturbance at this this time of year which is vitally important for them the, the obviously the nesting season so we have a fully licensed and obviously know what we're doing going into going into the going into the sites and that's obviously critical to avoid avoid disturbance. Now last year we featured barn owls will we have the barn owl again this year? We hope we hope also to have barn owls that'll come a little bit later again uh, everything's quite quite delayed just because of the weather so hopefully by about mid-June we'll be able to again have an insight into the secret lives of barn owls at a, we've already a nest site lined up down in Kerry again this year so fingers crossed all going well we'll have both kestrels and barn owls up and running in the coming weeks. And barn owl numbers are they good? Um, the, the, the numbers are good but again it's probably it's, look, it's shaping up to be not a fantastic breeding season unfortunately with the way the weather is going so we'll have to wait and see it's quite an extended breeding season with barn owls and it, as I say it's quite delayed so they're just getting down to business now and it'll, it'll be a couple of months before we really know exactly what's going on and how the breeding season will fare. OK, John, thank you very much indeed. If you want to follow the progress of any of our birds, as I said, we've got swallows at Oris and Uteron, blue tits at my house, then we hope to have in the next week or so uh, kestrels and then maybe barn owls. Just simply log on to our website, rte.ie forward slash Mooney, and we give you regular updates every day on RT Radio 1 between 3 and half 4. As I said, uh, this is a race that's taking place right now over the next 24 hours, BioBlitz 2013. We're at Glendalock. There are three other locations right now. We're going to have a look and see what's going on at Lock Key. Loch Key Forest Park sits on the southern shores of Loch Key in County Roscommon. The park is a mixture of woodland, wetland, grassland and wild little islands, some of them with these amazing ruins. And the whole area stretches over 350 hectares. Now the park used to be part of an old country estate, but was acquired by the government in the 1950s, and is now managed by Quilcher and Roscommon County Council. The broadleaf trees are just coming into leaf now, and you'll find plenty of ash, oak, beech, lime, sycamore and horse chestnut. Spring in the park is a special time with the woodland flowers bursting to life. Bluebells, wild garlic, 
wood anemones, sorrel and primrose. All are emerging from the woodland floor after a particularly cold few months. Now one of the most colourful and striking of Irish birds, the jay is a common sight in the park. Now it's a kind of crow, but with bright blue and white flashes on their wings and a loud harsh call, they are unmistakable. The park has a very healthy population of two of our most elusive mammals, the red squirrel and the pine marten. The River Shannon has largely stopped the western march of the red squirrel's great rival, the grey squirrel, which hasn't yet reached Loch Key. And so the reds thrive here but they move so fast through the canopy, they're really hard to spot. My name is Eugenie Regan. I work at the National Biodiversity Data Centre as an ecologist, and I'm coordinating bioblitz at Lockheed. I will be coordinating the experts, getting them to go to all the different places, making sure everyone's got the equipment they need, and getting the camp together. And at the end, at five o'clock, we need to have one total number of species for the sites. That's my job. OK. So it's not just about the place, but it's about the, the team of investigators who are there, you reckon? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to let my secrets out. Um, we've got... I want to go for a lot for the little things. So we've got somebody looking at diatoms, bryophytes, lichens, insects, snails and slugs. With one lichen person, so we're going to have to try and race him around as much as possible. <laughs> Who's going to argue with the lichen guy? Exactly. You know, can they go, really? So is this going to be good for insects? This is going to be heaven for insects. My passion is for insects. They are the most species diverse group of animals and plants in the whole of Ireland, with over 11,000 species of insects in Ireland. So I'm hoping to get a small fraction of those insects here. And one species I'm looking for in particular is the Irish damselfly, a really rare species of damselfly. The only place it occurs is in this part of Ireland, the northwest of Ireland. So what chances do you think Lockheed have of winning this competition? I think Lockheed will do quite well. Um, I predict about 800 different species of animals and plants on the day. But unfortunately, we're up against Wicklow National Park, a huge um, park, and we're up against Burr National Park, and we're up against a very good team in Fermanagh. So it really depends on the team on the day, as well as the site. Amazing stuff. 800 different species at Loch Key. So she reckons. I reckon they're pretty organised down there, and there's a lot of different kinds of habitats, you know? There's lots of fresh water, lots of old wood around. I reckon they're in with a good chance, Red those squirrel, guys. pine marten, dragonflies. It's all in the small stuff, though. Uh, right. That's where well, the numbers yeah, are going to yeah, be, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, yeah, yeah. it? Lads, we're getting loads sorry, of tweets. Yes, tweets. Yeah, yes. Kevin Fagan says, uh, just recorded the very important millipede in the burn for Bioblitz. Helps break down wood from hawthorn trees. So the burn are in a twin Well, if you then. count its legs alone, you'd win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They need to find a few more of them. I only have time for the one. Will I call out another one? Really yes, quickly. Yes, yes. Cuckoo's cheering us on in the burn for Bioblitz. Yeah. See, it's all the monster crowd tweeting in. Sorry about that, lads. All right. <laughs> uh, keep sending in your tweets. It seems like RTE Goes Wild has captured everything everybody's imagination in the month of May, including our editors who've put together this little package for you. Have a look. Well, how come you say you will when you won't? You tell me you do, baby, when you don't. Let me know, honey, how you feel. Tell the truth now, is love real? Uh -uh. Oh, honey, don't. And a beautiful kingfisher at the end. Fantastic stuff. Coming up after the break, we'll be learning more from our experts and we'll be finding out about this bird of prey's extraordinary story.
Well, it's looking absolutely beautiful up here in uh, Glendalough in County Wicklow today. Now, I told you just before the break we were going to learn about the story of a bird of prey. It's called the red kite, and I'm delighted to say we've got Mark Ruddock here uh, from the Golden Eagle Trust who's going to tell us all about this bird because, Mark, it hasn't, it, well, it hadn't been seen in the skies around Wicklow for 200 years. It hadn't. They were totally extinct, driven to extinction by age-old human attitudes. Uh, anything with a hooked beak and talons was often persecuted. And, of course, large parts of Ireland were deforested, so this is a woodland species, uh, very dependent on woodland for nesting, uh, and they were, were lost 200 years ago. Why? That for those very reasons, uh, as a poor attitudes um, that, that people had towards birds of prey, um, and really uh, the deforestation would have had a large part to play as well in it, you know. Mm. So talk to me about this. You brought them back in. Where did you get them from? How many did you bring in? Absolutely. And how successful has the project been? The project has been a, a roaring success, thanks to testament to a huge number of people. Um, it's a partnership project between the Golden Eagle Trust, the Welsh Kite Trust, and National Parks and Wildlife Service. Uh, and obviously the, the Welsh Kite Trust were very important because we collected the birds from the wild in Wales. They were mm -hmm. taken out of the nest, brought back to Wicklow, um, and kept in cages for six weeks. Uh, and then they were released back into the wild. So we've released 120 in Wicklow between 2007 and 2011, and 39 as well in County Dublin in 2011. So do you have to take in more, or is that it? No, the releases have finished now. So the release is finished in 2011, um, but the birds are breeding naturally themselves now. So in 2010, we had a big milestone with the project, and they successfully reared young. We had 12 young reared in that year. Uh, and in 2011, we had 17 young, yeah. uh, and in 2012, we had 23 young. So at the minute, we are in the process of finding nests all across County Wicklow, um, uh, and hopefully we've got, should have somewhere between 25 and 30 pairs uh, this year. No. Has <laughs> every bird <laughs> got one of these? A little wing uh, tag. Absolutely. <laughs> all of myself, a number 45. Absolutely. So all the birds are marked individually. So during, later on in the summer, we'll go into the nests uh, and put wing tags on the chicks uh, to find out. It's basically to help us identify them. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really, really important if the public do see them and um, that they report them to um, our website at uh, www.goldeneagle.ie. Um, it helps us keep a track of how long the birds uh, survive for, how many young they have. And you can actually tell which area they've come from. So on the okay. left wing, uh, Wicklow birds have a blue, a blue tag, uh, and that red tag you're holding there was last year's colour, um, which was 2012. So the right wing tells you how old the bird is. How old well. the bird is? Okay. Absolutely. Well, the very best of luck with the project. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much indeed, Mark. Now our next bio blitz site is known throughout the island of Ireland and beyond for its natural beauty, but it has some hidden wildlife secrets. The representative for BioBlitz is the Burren National Park in County Clare. The Burren is one of Ireland's most iconic landscapes. And today over 250 square kilometres of dramatic fractured limestone stretch across North County Clare and South Galway. It actually formed when Ireland wasn't where it is now at all. Ireland was somewhere near the equator, perhaps south of the equator, covered in a tropical sea. And over time, the sediments that were in that sea accumulated to form the rock that you see around us today, this limestone rock. It's a glacial karst landscape. Effectively, it's, it's weathered limestone. It's not quite a managed landscape, but it's actually it's, it's a man-influenced landscape. The farming practices in the burn have shaped and given us the habitats that we have here today. The fractures and hollows in the rocks are home to over 450 flowering plants and 140 different ferns. And because the limestone acts like a giant storage heater, absorbing the sun's heat and releasing it slowly over time, the burn has a very long growing season. There are lots of different kinds of plants that are, that are abundant here that are very, very scarce elsewhere. So you have southern plants like orchids, living cheek by jowl beside plants that are associated with the Arctic. And that's an amazing thing. One of the best known is the spring gentian, a sparkling blue flower more usually found in the high mountains of Europe. And this is great for butterflies. 34 different species have been recorded in Ireland as a whole, and over 30 of these have been seen in the burrow. 
The burren also became a refuge for other animals that had disappeared from much of Ireland, such as the stoat, often seen as a flash of brown among the rocks as it hunts for mice and rabbits. I'm Colette O'Flynn and I work in Ireland's National Biodiversity Data Centre. What are the most interesting plants and animals that call the burren home? What you get are like you get the Irish stoat, a beautiful mammal species, the pine martin, which is really coming back in high numbers again. And there's some invertebrates that are unique to the area as well, and we have some freshwater ecologists coming down and looking for them. Half of all of Ireland's plants can be found here, about 600 of them. You know, if our experts are in top form, hopefully they'll record a lot of them. There's an awful lot of these bugs and insects found here. They'll get the numbers up pretty quickly. One of the most interesting um, animals would be the slow worm. It's a legless lizard introduced into the burn, so it wouldn't naturally have been found in Ireland. But it is here in quite high numbers in some places. Oh, it would be fantastic. I mean, it would be the winning site for 2013, the BioBlitz site. But it is also important from a scientific point of view. You get a snapshot. That one moment in time, those 24 hours, you have recorded as much as possible in this site. And that's of great scientific value as well, to see what is here at that one moment in time. One of Oliver Cromwell's generals complained about the burren, that there wasn't enough water to drown a man, wood to hang a man, or soil to bury him. Not much has changed in the almost 400 years that have passed since then, and today the burren is one of the jewels in Ireland's Wild West. It certainly is. I'm thinking Oliver Cromwell, the last snake to leave the burn, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm backing away from that. It can be hard to find species down there like the yeah, snake or the slow worm, which ear, isn't really a snake. Go. But um, that's why, Derek, the National Biodiversity um, Data Centre have set up special courses to actually teach people the skills to track down, you know, awkward to find plants yeah. and animals. And when I was down well, there... like the slow worms, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And when I was down there, I met one of the youngest recruits they have. He's only eight. He's oh, amazing. What, what's his name? Jimmy Marin. Jimmy Check Marin. Legend. My name is Jimmy Marin and I'm a recorder for the National Bumblebee Survey of Ireland. This is my bee box. Well, okay, how many different species of bees are in there? Two or three. Okay, what's he? He's a red tail. And, the and that's the common carder. I'm really interested to find out how you got into bumblebees. Well, it all started on this bee walk we did in the barn, and I got really into it. We're trying to find species of bees and letting people know that there are more species than you think. We just learned that bees aren't as bad as you think. And they're just one of nature's miracles, really. Because if they weren't here, There'll be no trees, no plants, no grass. And that's all then for the National Bumblebee Survey, is it? Yes. Are you, like, in love with all things from nature? Mm, pretty much, yes. Yeah. What a cool little guy that fella is. He really is. He's such an enthusiastic young recorder. Now, I'm here with Gillian Stewart. Uh, you're lucky enough to work in Wicklow Mountains National Park. So for someone who hasn't been here, what sorts of habitats are to be found? Well, Colin, Wicklow Mountains National Park covers 20,000 hectares of the Wicklow Mountains. So much of it is blanket bog and heathland. But here in the Valley of Glendalough, we have fabulous oak woodlands, native oak woodlands, and native Scots pine woodlands, and also a lake and some rivers. So fabulous habitats for wildlife. Well, excellent. You know, last night I got one of these trail cameras and I stuck it out not far from here and we got all sorts of badgers and things visiting. Yeah, the badgers, fabulous animals, really healthy population here. And you can see them feeding on the lawns. They have a fabulous nose and they like to eat earthworms and beetles, amongst other things. And you can, they can smell the worms under the ground and use their claws to dig them out. And in doing so, they leave a little hole, which we call a snuffle hole, which we can see all over the lawns here. 
snuffle hole. I've never heard of one of those. But for BioBlitz, you don't actually have to see the mammal itself because some of them can be very hard to find, particularly if there's lots of people tramping around the place. But you have potentially evidence of their presence is enough. So what sorts of evidence do we have here in front of us? That's right, Colin. We can clock up a species if we get the evidence. So these are hazelnuts here. And hazelnuts obviously are food for red squirrels. We have lots of red squirrels here. And you can see when they crack a hazelnut in half, you can actually see the teeth marks at the top. These little ones, with the, these are also hazelnuts, but they've been chewed in a different way. And you can see the little teeth marks around the edge of the hole. And there are wood mice feeding on those. Then you can find um, pine cones. This is a whole pine cone. And this is one after a squirrel has eaten it. Um, we can find hair. We have deer hair here, fox hair. Droppings, of course, loads of those. These are deer droppings. And then badger droppings, really interesting, because you can see the blue bits in them from the, the shells of the beetles they've been eating. And I found one of these beetles earlier. This lovely little guy here, if I just get him out. This is a dung beetle, a door beetle. And you can actually see the blue underneath him that you can see in the, the badger poo after he's, he's eaten him and passed him through. So that's the sort of thing we find, you know. Well, look, what a beautiful little beetle he is. So I wonder how many mammals they're going to find in Wicklow National Park over the next 24 hours. I wonder. Only time will tell, eh? So we also have these... Uh, Thank you very much indeed, uh, Colin. Well, this year's BioBlitz 2013 is dedicated to the memory of a remarkable man who's responsible for introducing generations of Irish people to the beauty of Ireland's flora and fauna. Eamon de Butler. Over 30 years of making natural history programmes and I still get very enthusiastic about this kind of lovely landscape. But it wasn't always this way. was set up some days ago and the herons have accepted it as part of their landscape. This is what makes some of the hardship in wildlife filming worthwhile. Close-up sequences of a shy and beautiful falcon rearing its chicks. I was attracted to Connemara by the music, the song, and of course the people. Looking back on a career in wildlife filmmaking, I see great changes in the countryside as it comes under pressure from many different quarters. But it should be remembered that we are the present caretakers of a beautiful island rich in plant and animal life. We should look after it for the benefit of ourselves, our wildlife, and of course, future generations. Ireland is as beautiful and mysterious a location as any in which I have filmed. And who knows what I might photograph today. The late, great Eamon de Butler, I'm sure his likes will never be seen again. He was a, a great naturalist, a fantastic broadcaster, super musician, and a lovely man. We interviewed him many times on the radio programme. Colin, did you ever work with him? Yeah, I never really worked with him as such, but uh, he was certainly an inspiration to me. I think the likes will not be seen again. He was, you know, a trailblazer in Ireland for the kind of work he did. Yeah, and no, the work continues him. with programmes like this. Uh, join us again after the break.
Welcome back to Bible Blitz 2013, live from Glendalough in the Wicklow National Park. This is a race for centres around the country. They've got 24 hours to count as many wildlife species and plants as they possibly can to win the title of BioBlitz Champions 2013. Isn't that right, Janine? That's right. I feel like we're in a race across Glen <laughs> uh, We got a tweet in here from John Breen, who's just recorded seven species of ant from the burn. Two are rare species in Ireland. So well done to them. Well done, John. Another one from the burn. In now, his pants. Yeah. Ants. <laughs> <laughs> There's been loads of fascinating finds so far. Plenty more to come, I'm sure, Derek. But right here in Lendonock, there are six major river systems, and you know what? You'd be amazed to find out what lurks beneath. Fish. <laughs> I reckon you know that BioBlitz is going to be won and lost on the small creatures, and there's no place better to look for small creatures than in fresh water. And I'm here with Mary Kelly Quinn, who is right now trying to find some creatures that are lurking at the bottom of the river. How's it going, Mary? Hello, Not too bad. We have a few things here to show you. Uh, so these are aquatic insects and they spend most of their life in the larval or nymphal stage. So what we have here are some mayflies with the three tails. Uh, stoneflies here, some stoneflies, some caddis so they would be the, form the bulk of the aquatic invertebrate community. But they're also extremely important indicators of water quality. So where you see these large flat flies you can see walking here, and the stone flies, it's a sure indicator of good water quality. Okay, and it was interesting there you mentioned mayflies, because you know I think a lot of people say mayflies only live for a day, but that's not quite the case, is it? Yeah, the adults only live for a day, and the sole purpose the adult stage is for reproduction, so they mate, they lay their eggs. The larval stage or the nymphal stage then lives for several months in water, so they're present in water during the summertime. And the same thing with dragonflies and damselflies and all sorts caddis of things. Caddisflies. So in fact you can see there is one caddisfly here that has formed a little cocoon and he's been transformed into an adult within that cocoon and he'll emerge in a few days' time. Very good. So how many species do you think you are going to find in the fresh water in Wicklow National Park tonight, I think today? I need to reveal our secret, but I would say that we'll talk up at least a hundred species. A hundred species? Easily a hundred species tomorrow. Did you say easily a hundred? Comfortably, yes. We'll hold you to that. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, Colin. A hundred species, OK. And we've got a lot of moths in Wicklow National Park as well. We're looking at one here now. It's called the poplar hawk moth. This is Angus Tyner. Angus, thank you for bringing your poplar hawk moth. Where did you get it? Well, I actually got it in my garden last night. But it's a widespread and common species all over Ireland and would be found in most gardens. Where is your garden? It's down in Ashford in Wicklow. Well, I take it you're not going to count this now, tonight no, or tomorrow, no, are you? No, it doesn't count for here. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be brought back home later. So you're one of the recorders. You're recording the moth species here yes, at Wicklow National yes. Park. Is it, is it a hobby? Is it a profession? What? No, it's a, it's a hobby of mine. I got into it about 10 years ago. I, I saw this, you know, this beautiful moth in a, a icy cold day in November. At, at the bedroom window, the light was on inside the house. I went out and had a look and it was wow, what is this? So I went, I had some connections, your naturalist connections, and I found out it was a feathered thorn mm -hmm. and a common moth. I said, I haven't seen one before. But you hadn't noticed one before, you probably saw them. Well, probably, probably, but similar to the poplar hawk moth, you know, they're yeah. everywhere, but not many people see them or they might see them sort of once in a lifetime. So that sort of, you know, nurtured an interest and, and then I sort of got a, you know, a moth book and, and, and a moth trap afterwards. And, and now you I, love them and I'm told you're Ireland's oh, it's, expert it's, on it's, moths. It's, it's addictive. Well, I'm relatively an, an, an expert. No, 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 nothing relative <laughs> about it. I'm told you're the ex you're the guy that people go to about moths. Well, they do send for my records, for yeah. records to me. I'm and just I'm wondering, has Wicklow got a disadvantage? Because they have you. A disadvantage? Yeah, because you know all the uh, stuff. No, it's... A, a, advantage, sorry, come on, Shkail, advantage. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a disadvantage. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, they're, they're going to do well with moths. How many moth species do you think? Well, we had this event here about three years ago, and it was about 90 species. Um, but the weather isn't as good tonight, so I'll be happy with, say, 30 species. It's been a very slow year, a, a late spring. Well, we're hoping to talk to Jerry Murphy from Ed Aaron a little bit later yeah, on. Yeah. And as far as we know, it's going to be pretty dry all night long. There's only a light breeze at the moment. It's Would... a cold breeze, though. I mean, it's not even... that bad. No, no, but... Right. Oh, yeah, remain optimistic. You never know what's in the trap in the well, morning. Well, if it's windy, do these guys stay in bed, so to speak? They do. They don't, they don't fly around as much. So, right. um, but you never know that there's so many species out there. 
and you, you just don't know what's in the trap in the morning. So there can, could be some surprises. Can I ask you, is this guy alive or dead? Oh no, he's 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 just resting dr dr during the day. Like most moths, they're nocturnal. Yeah. You know, they fly at night, and if he flies in the day, he gets spotted by some eagle-eyed blackbird or robin, and he, and he's dinner. So his his purpose is to rest by day, conceal himself. That's why he looks like a leaf. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, obviously, obviously, obviously not in an egg tray, but you know, his usual resting place would be in a shrub or a tree or something, mm. and it wouldn't be noticed. I'm thinking back to what you said, that when you first saw the moth outside your bedroom window, you went, wow, most people go, ah! <laughs> and I think, the, uh, was it Silence well, of the did. Lambs? Did you ever see Silence of the Lambs? Uh, a long time ago. Yeah, uh, Anthony uh, Hopkins did for moths mm. what Steven Spielberg did for sharks, I think. You know, the death's head yeah, hawk moth. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they don't sting or they don't bite no, or, they don't. or whatever. So. But they scare you. But <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> they scare some they, people. They, they do scare oh, some, oh. but... But you're here to say they're lovely creatures. Yeah, there's nothing to be scared nothing of. Be scared no, of no, no. Well, listen, we wish you the very best of luck. How many are on your team here? Uh, there's a few coming up. I think there's about four or five or so. Okay, just looking Give at moths. Yeah, and then and the help. rest of the people are doing other stuff because yeah. 180 people out over yeah, the next 24 yeah, hours at the yeah. four centres. As we said, yeah. this is a race. They all want to be champs. We wish them all the very best of luck. Thank you, Angus. Yeah, nice to you. talk to you. You're welcome, Derek. I think Colin is next. Hopefully they managed to record a good few tonight. Now it's always great to be part of a first and this year we're delighted to be part of the first ever wildlife exploration of an area few people get to see. It's the beautiful Colbrook Estate in County Fermanagh. The Northern Ireland site for Ireland's BioBlitz 2013 is Colbrook Estate in County Fermanagh. And the event here is being organised by the Centre for Environmental Data and Recording. Colbrook Park is a spectacular 1,000 acre working estate set in beautiful Fermanagh countryside. The private family home of Viscount of Viscountess Brookborough, Colbrook is one of the region's most important and historic stately houses and has been in their family since the 1590s. Can you describe the various different sort of types of land on this estate? And we've got a lot of old woodland, and as with many places in Ireland, and especially this year, it's quite wet. We've got trout and pike in the river, which are very good because it's one of the main spawning rivers for Loch Arne, which is one of the good freshwater fishing areas in Ireland. In the river, we also have um, European crayfish. There are quite a few places in Ireland but of course, UK-wide and Europe-wide, they're very much endangered. We have otters. We unfortunately have mink. We've got kingfishers. We've just got woodpeckers in the last three or four years. We had a problem one night at two in the morning. There was a noise on the inside of the window, and, and there was a noise like a cat going mad. And I got up, and it was a pine martin that had come into our bedroom window and it was trying to get in and out and do whatever. And I said, I must get a camera. My wife said, no, you bloody well won't. You get rid of it. <laughs> anyway. And we actually trapped it, and then I let it out outside my brother's house. Unlike some of this year's other BioBlitz sites, Colbrook has never been biologically surveyed, so it's a blank canvas in terms of what kinds of animals and plants are found here. I'm Kate Crane. I've been the estate manager on Colebrook for the last few years. The estate is about a thousand acres, about half of which is trees, broadleaf woodland, ancient woodland. I'd say Colebrook would do fairly well from a biodiversity point of view. First of all, it's a private estate. It's, it's pretty much undisturbed. People don't have access really to it, so nature can do its own thing here. One of the things that makes biodiversity interesting is having deadwood around. It's absolutely full of saprozylic invertebrates, all the invertebrates that are eating away at the deadwood in the centre of the tree. So you'll have a massive variety of insects just on this one particular tree. Well, I didn't realise that it was a competition. Um, because if I'd realised it was a competition, there wouldn't have been any point in any others taking part. So do you think you've assembled a crack team? It's the most certainly secret from you. In addition to the river environment, there's also parkland, farmland, ponds, lake, fen, forestry, a walled garden and a large area of bog. 
overall it's a remarkable wildlife haven. Who knows what might turn up? An absolutely gorgeous place and we wish you the very best of luck indeed. Now the BioBlitz teams have just over 21 hours to go and they'll be working all through the night and of course the weather will play a huge role in what they see and what they don't see. So let's find out what the weather's going to be like. Jerry Murphy from Mad Erin has come down to Glendalough. Jerry, thanks for coming down. You're very welcome. And uh, just before we came back there you said dry butt. <laughs> yes, uh, cold. very cold tonight. A dry night everywhere but very cold, especially in the east. Uh, so temperatures dropping to maybe around four degrees in Glendalock. As the night goes on, becoming cloudier along the west coast, so the temperature will actually increase towards morning in the Burren. Temperatures there getting down to around seven degrees and around five or six then for uh, Lockheed Forest Park and for Colebrook Estate. So as Angus was saying there, the moths may stay put because it is a bit cold. Yes, it's a chilly night. It's there. a chilly night. What about tomorrow? Tomorrow then there's a contrast between the west and east. There is a band of rain moving slowly in from the west and it will hit the west West Coast first, so the Burren certainly will have a damp, murky day. Mm -hmm. Plenty of rain and drizzle there. Lockheed Forest Park, then, that will be that bit uh, cloudy at first, possibly dry during the morning, but again, turning murky then as you move through the afternoon. Still 14 degrees, isn't it? Still bad. 14 degrees, yeah. A very mild, humid day, mm -hmm. uh, especially over the western half of the country. Now, uh, Colebrook Estate should stay dry for a good part of the day, but again, not possibly completely so. We'll see the drizzle getting in there later on. However, the best of the weather will certainly be um, in Glendalough, where we'll see temperatures 15, possibly 16 degrees, and it will stay dry there with some sunshine. So, so right here where we are in the Garden of Ireland, Yes, it will be the pleasantest day. Yeah, 180 people out of the four sites, and it looks like we're going to get the weather. Indeed, <laughs> we're yeah. going to get everything else. So I think people will be very disappointed at these other sites. Well, only the Burren will have the dampest day. The others gradually uh, getting yeah. damp. Well, you see, now the Burren, if it's going to be damp, that's going to keep the slow worms under the stones. Indeed. Because they need the heat. That's true. Well, will, well, there will have plenty of heat through the day. It's going to be a, quite a mild day. Like temperatures will be up 14, 15 degrees in the burn, and then, as I said, gradually increasing, maybe 16 degrees at Colebrook and possibly 16, maybe 17 degrees in Glendalough. All right, Jerry, thank you very much indeed. And we just want to say the very best of luck to all teams. We know they are participating in this broadcast. They're listening, they're watching RTE Live and all that kind of stuff. So good luck to each and every one of you. Colin. Well, the clock is ticking and soon darkness is going to fall and the teams are going to find themselves facing very different challenges. And here are some of the creatures that they may encounter tonight. Well, from now on, the teams are on their own. I hope we've encouraged you to get out and take a closer look at the natural world around you. I guarantee you won't be disappointed. No, they won't, because they've already found two Sequoiadendron giganteum spotted in Lockheed. So that's good news. We like it. We've had such a good evening and such a great month across RTE radio and television. If you want to get any more details, just check out rte.e slash rte goes wild. Yeah, and just look at that uh, view behind us. Isn't that just amazing? 
beautiful evening and beautiful weather. Get down to one of your uh, national parks and enjoy the biodiversity that's out there. That's pretty much all we have time for this evening, live from Glendalough. But we will be back again on Sunday evening at 7.30 and we'll be having a look at what has been recorded over the next 24-hour period. Remember, this is a race. Four centres, 180 people. All teams want to be BioBlitz champions for 2013. Don't miss it. RT1, Sunday evening at 7.30. Until then, bye-bye. See ya. Bye.